elements. So I've introduced you to one element called nitrogen. And the other element in the system I would like to introduce you to is something called phosphorus. Now, phosphorus is, is an element called P. It's often just abbreviated as P. And it's found in all proteins. It's found in all genetic material. And it's essentially the battery of the cell. So plants have to take up phosphorus also from the soil and stores it in little ever ready or those expensive Duracell batteries, okay? And then they use it and then it runs down and they have to replenish the batteries, okay? So have a, a picture in your mind. Remember the little Duracell pink bunny on television 100 years ago? That's what a plant is doing. It's taking up all this phosphorus, storing it in batteries to build uh, proteins and genetic material. And unlike nitrogen, that is all over the place, in the atmosphere, cycling around, getting burnt off, phosphorus is just about immobile. It's all in the soil, and it sits there and it doesn't care a hoot. It says, I'm here, I've been here since the beginning of time or before, come and fetch me. If you want me, you come and get me. I'm not coming to you. All right, so got the difference. Nitrogen free and happy and floats around. Phosphorus says, ha, ah, the banks in the soil, you break into me, and then together you have to put the nitrogen and the phosphorus together to make a plant, so that the plant can be eaten by the animal, so that we can eat the animal, and so things go on. Got it. So, so what's happened over time? Over time, in certain legumes, have you heard of legumes? Those are plants that can be little, like peas and beans that we eat, or pretty things like sweet peas in our garden, but they can also be big trees, like the acacias, and they all make little pods like this that have their seeds in them. But they fall into this very big uh, plant family called the uh, Fabaceae. And there are certain subfamilies within the Fabaceae that are able to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. And the way that they do that is that they have made an agreement with soil organisms little bacteria, which you can't see, and together the bacteria, the genetics in the bacterium, and the genetics in the root come together, the genetics are compatible, and the tissue of the root essentially forms like a cancerous growth. And it makes what we call a root nodule, it's about the size of the second or your pinky nail, okay, for comparative size. So it's a tiny little round whitish thing like that in the soil. Very fragile. If you pull a root plant out, you'll, the nodules will stay in the soil. If you want to look at them, you have to dig the plant out, which is not trivial for some acacias. So the bacterium makes a house together with the plant root, and then the bacterium goes to work. And if you cut those nodules in half with a, a razor blade, these little nodules have white tissue around the outside, and then they've got this funny red stuff in the middle. And this funny red stuff in the middle is exactly the same pigment that you have in your blood hemoglobin. And what hemoglobin does, it's just a, a different chemical form of this hemoglobin, it lives, the bacteria make it together with the genetics of the root, it makes this red pigment, and just like hemoglobin in your blood, it captures oxygen and moves it around in your blood. In this nodule, it captures the oxygen and holds it very tightly, which means that the tissue in here becomes what we call anaerobic. It has a low oxygen tension. 
And if you were a chemical engineer and you worked at African Explosives or any other company like that, you would understand that to take atmospheric nitrogen gas, which is an N and an N and it's got three arms, and those three arms hold the two nitrogen molecules together really, really tightly, and you can't split them. Plants can't use nitrogen gas. They have to split that nitrogen molecule. And the only way you can split that nitrogen molecule, it doesn't matter if you've got a chemical factory or if you've got one of these little nodules which are also a chemical factory. You've taken the oxygen out of the factory. That allows those two nitrogen molecules to blow apart from each other exactly the same way you would do it in a laboratory. So here you've got this tiny little bacterium, which is going, yeah, 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 I can blow apart nitrogen, okay? So it blows apart the two nitrogen molecules. It captures either a hydrogen or it captures an oxygen. And in this little molecule, it makes fertilizer, either nitrate or ammonium. And then plants, it feeds the nitrogen back into the plant, and that's the form in which nitrogen comes into the system. Okay, so the only way nitrogen gas can get into our ecosystems is through the helping hands of teeny weeny bacteria and the root nodule and the genetics and the chemistry and all sorts of things. But it's miraculous, okay? The, the Germans were the first people to actually define this process, the Harbour-Bosch process. Of course, the Chinese were the first to make explosives. But they you were using a technology that this little bacterium has been using in nutrient-poor soils for hundreds of thousands of years. I think that's miraculous. Okay, except I was told miraculous only happens once, so I shouldn't use that word. All right. So, one example. An another example is that another small helping hand is a fungus. So, we've got this big bank of phosphorus in the soil, and I mentioned that phosphorus doesn't come to the plant root. The plant root, which are these yellowish colored structures here under very high magnification, the plant root has to grow into the area of where the phosphorus is. Now that could be one centimeter, it could be half a meter, it could be two kilometers, okay? The root has to grow towards the phosphorus because phosphorus is immobile and it just sits there. So the root can do that, but it means the plant above ground has to make a lot more food send it downstairs into the roots, grow, grow root, grow root, grow root, go and find phosphorus. Now, if you're using all your energy growing roots, your top is gonna stay quite small. You won't be able to make flowers, you can't make seeds. If somebody eats you, you've gotta start the engine all over again. So, what many plants have done, especially in our African systems where the soils are so devoid of nutrients, they have made an association with a fungus, which in Latin or Greek is called mycor, and root is, is also fun, uh, Latin or Greek for root. So the, uh, the structure is called a mycorrhizae, which is a fungus root association, and it costs the plant significantly less to grow fungus than it does to grow root. So the fungus makes the association, again genetically, with the surface of the root and says, okay, send me some carbohydrate from above ground and I will grow out and go and bring the phosphorus back to you and send it upstairs. So a schematic of essentially the volume of soil that's occupied by fungus relative to the volume of soil that's occupied by root. You can see it here, there's a few roots, and then all of this 
is this intricate, like um, cotton wool that you've taken and spread out into the soil. And what's really interesting in the African system, people laugh and say, oh, African plants are the first organisms on the continent to show Ubuntu. Because if you look beneath the soil, this web of hyphal mat connects everything to everything else. So you connect it to you, and you connect it to you, and you connect it to you, and you're all moving carbohydrate below ground together. So it creates a very interesting um, convergence of ideas around speciation and biodiversity and all sorts of things.